Hello and welcome to The Matt Lagore Show. I'm Matt Lagore, your host. My show is about being an entrepreneur, business, personal growth, and inspiration. Now, not necessarily in that order or not necessarily all at the same time, but ever since I was a little boy, I've been an entrepreneur. When I was 12 years old, I had a magazine route and I delivered Time and Newsweek magazine. And that was my first venture into sole proprietorship or entrepreneurism. Now, at the time when I was 12, I didn't know I was an entrepreneur. It was just something my parents wanted me to do, probably to keep me busy. But I learned a valuable lesson in it that for the work that I did, I got paid for. And I liked it. So from that point on, I pretty much was an entrepreneur. Now, um, as far as I said about being uh, business and personal growth and inspiration, I found that those things all kind of go hand in hand. So on my show, uh, we're going to be talking about entrepreneurism, business, personal growth, and inspiration. And like I said, not all at the same time and not in that order. Because I found that I think most people want to be inspired in this day and age we live in. Uh, if you turn on the news now, uh, you turn on the TV, um, you pretty much talk to anybody and negativity will come up in abundance. It's the one thing in life that you can get as much as you want for free. So here on the Matt Lagore Show, we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about negativity because my goal is, is I hope to at some point maybe inspire somebody to do something that they wanted to do. Whether it's be an entrepreneur, start a business, maybe go do a personal growth course or something to help build you up, help break you through a barrier. Um, a few years ago, I uh, had wanted to lose some weight. So I told my wife, I said, Allison, I want to I wanna lose some weight and I, I, I want to do something to get back in shape. And she said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. I'll do something radical, uh, but I'm going to do it when we get back from vacation. We're about to go on vacation. So uh, she said, uh, eh, okay. I, I don't know if she really believed me or not. It didn't really matter. I knew what I wanted to do, but I needed to think about it. Um, so when I got back from vacation, I got a phone call from a friend of mine. And a friend of mine said, hey, how you doing? You know, I'm going to be doing this thing called the Tough Mudder. And uh, I want to know if you want to do it with me. Now, I'd never heard of the Tough Mudder. I said, well, what is it? He goes, oh, it's kind of this thing. It's like an obstacle course, and you run up a mountain, and they, you know, shoot you with a hose, and you have to climb walls. I'm like, sounds kind of radical, you know? And I thought to myself, well, radical, that was kind of like what I was thinking when I told my wife I wanted to lose weight. So I just said to him, okay, I'll do it. And then I watched this video on the Tough Mudder, and I really regretted my decision because I said, this is going to be really hard. But for four months, I trained every single day to get ready for that event, and I did it. And now I was nervous and I was scared, but what I was left with when I was done was I was inspired. Actually, I was inspired from the start when I said I would to when I did it. The, the whole process, the really the inspiration came from saying I would to when I did it. The culmination was doing it. Um, it was quite an experience. Uh, I got beat up pretty good, all right? But I loved it, and I had that experience for the rest of my life. Now, that's the kind of thing I hope to inspire somebody to do, something they've always wanted to do or something they may never have thought of. Um, I think every one of us in life wants to be great, wants to be good, but things hold us back. We get uh, told you can't or it's not a good idea. And usually the people that tell you that are uh, either someone with the same last name as you and your family or your best friend. And they don't mean to do it in a way to hurt you. They're trying to protect you but really all that ha comes from that is um, they're holding you, keeping you from what you really want. So I hope that on this show, with the people I have on, that will lead you to maybe reach the goal you want. Uh, and on the show, the show's not going to just be about me. It's not going to just be about my story because I think after two shows, people would stop watching. And as it is, people may stop watching after two shows, but I'm going to have good guests on every week who are going to tell us their story about business, inspiration, entrepreneurship. And today I'm going to have a really good guest on, a really good friend of mine, Steve Orn. He's a co-founder of Rumson's Rum. And Steve is one of those guys who comes up, has an idea, and he will turn it into reality. And I've always been very impressed by that with Steve. So he'll be on right after uh, the first break we take. Um, but I just want to tell you one story. Now, if any of you out there are watching, uh, you may know me, you may not know me, but uh, I'm a business owner. I own a little business here right in North Reading called Dentcraft. 
Uh, I've done uh, paintless dent removal, which is what Dentcraft is, for about 20 years. Uh, you may be thinking to yourself, um, well, you know, I already have a business. I, it's too late to try something else. Or you might say to yourself, eh, I'm a little old for that. You know, sometimes I feel that way. I say, you know, maybe I'm a little too old to try something new. But I want to tell you a story about a person. His name uh, is uh, Harland Sanders. Now, I don't know if you know who Harland Sanders is, but uh, he also had a little prefix in the front of his name, which was called Colonel Har Harland Sanders, all right? or Colonel Sanders, Mr. Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? Everybody knows who Colonel Sanders is. All right? I don't care. He, at one time, he was known to be the second most recognizable person in the world uh, beh behind uh, Jesus Christ. That's pretty good recognition. But many of you may not know the story of Colonel Sanders. All right? Colonel Sanders was an entrepreneur, a businessman. He worked very hard. Um, he had uh, good success, moderate success. He had restaurants. He had a gas station that had a restaurant in it. He won some awards. But long story short is by the time he was 65, he was broke. He had no business anymore. And he was collecting Social Security. Now, uh, Colonel Sanders only collected Social Security for one, one time, one check, for 105 bucks, and he didn't like it. It made him feel old. And many people may not know, but he actually even contemplated suicide. But he didn't contemplate it for too long, and he decided what he would do was he was going to go out and promote his brand of chicken. And uh, he wanted to sell the recipe, and he wanted to go to restaurants and have the restaurants use his recipe. And what he wanted is he was very, very tough businessman. He wanted a nickel for every chicken that they sold. I don't know how he thought he was going to keep track of that, but, but he did. So he went around to restaurants and tried to sell his recipe. Now, how many times do you think people said no to him? A hundred? No. Two hundred? No. 300? No. 400? No. 500? No. All right, I'm going to stop there because he was told no 109 times. If I'm told no five times, I'm defeated. All right, this guy went on after being told no 109 times to become the most successful franchisee in the history of franchises at the time with Kentucky Fried Chicken. At the age of 65, he started that retirement age at 65. He died when he was 90 years old. Uh, he was a millionaire, and he had the most recognizable uh, franchise, restaurant franchise in the world. And we still see it today. And a matter of fact, they even do, they brought him back from the dead, and they have uh, very comical commercials with uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. So anyway, if you think you're too old, you're not. All right? If you think you can't, guess what? You can. So when we get back, I'm going to have my guest Steve Warren on, and he's the co-founder of Rumson's Rum. And we're going to have Steve, he's going to tell his story, not about Rumson's, but also about himself. So we'll have Steve on as soon as we get back. As I told you before, I was going to have my guest Steve Orn from Rumson's Rum on with me. And as you can see right in front of me, we have a display of his product. And here sitting next to me is my good friend Steve Orn from Rumson's Rum. How are you, Steve? Not I'm great. Great, that's good. Steve, you're always a regular guest on the Matt Lagore show. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I mentioned it before, but I do a weekly radio show too. And you've you've come on there a few times, and you told us about your product and your business. At the time, the first time I had you on, it was somewhat of a new venture. Uh, how long has Rumson's been uh, in business? Yeah, you're right, Matt. And I've always loved doing the radio show. Great show. You should tune in. But we've we've been in business now just over a year and a half. You're right, when we first started talking, I think it was even pre-launch, we were talking about what we were going to be doing. Now we've executed, we've had you know, a really nice run our first year and a half, we've won some great awards, but um, yeah, things are up and rolling and, and running smooth. Wow, a year and a half. So now, I think the very first time I talked to you about it was, how many years ago? Three years ago, when mm -hmm. you were started, like just the conversation about it, mm -hmm. and uh, I think you'd mentioned to me a lot, like, hey, we're getting, I, I have to... You get your bottles made in like France, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I remember just talking to you about it, and I was like, "Well, this just seems like a massive undertaking." I was like, "I kind of thought like, well, maybe that's just like a good idea he wants to talk about or do." But I mean, you were serious. So yeah. how long ago like was the idea uh, and put it like when was the first step? Would you say? Uh, well, that was taken by my cousin and business partner Eric Glass, probably about four years ago. Um, we sort of both find, found ourselves at the same time looking for professional transition, kind of like what's the next thing. Um, he had been collecting old rums 
and we saw what was happening in the world of micro distillers and the, the whole world of whiskey where people are um, sipping spirits straight that never before drank spirits straight. And we thought rum might have an opportunity and may one day have its, its day. So the research began as to whether that was a viable idea about four years ago by Eric. And then uh, as we began to talk about it, like, you know, what business would be, would it be fun to do a business together? Yes. And, um, you know, would this be a viable venture that we could both have a lot of fun at and make it earn a living at? And the answer was yes. So that's when the, the wheels really started clicking. Eric went to a distilling school. Uh, we made some modifications to our business plan, which we can talk about. But yeah, it began about four years ago. It was kind of like the seed was beginning to with, germinate. With a conversation yeah. with your cousin and, and obviously good friend. You guys have grown up together. So you guys are like pals. Right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We've uh, we've we've vacate. So it goes back to nursery school. Like we were buddies through nursery school. We graduated from the class of '84. Like, sorry to date my age. Yeah, but, me uh, too. Way right? to go, class '84, <laughs> right. strong. Yeah. Yeah, you're never too old to start a business, man. <laughs> um, yeah. So Marblehead High School. Um, we, you know, he was in my wedding. So we've been really good friends for a long time. Yeah. Now, and as we discussed in the past, uh, there were some things. Uh, you enjoyed uh, boating, mm -hmm. uh, and you enjoyed drinking rum. Yeah. Uh, you enjoyed putting a little rum and coke and having it uh, as a little uh, recreational drink and everything. So you took something that you liked, uh, something that you enjoyed, and you said, hey, I got an idea. Uh, you want, or, or Eric said, hey, I got an idea. And from there, now we're sitting here uh, four years later. We have the bottles in front of us. Uh, a year and a half of operation. Now, where, where do you uh, bottle the product? So we're in Salem, Mass. Um, we actually, I mentioned Eric went to distilling school and we made some modifications to the business plan. So we're a licensed distilling plant, but we don't distill in, in Salem uh, because we were really intrigued by very high quality aged complex rums that you could sip straight. We realized that we weren't going to be able to produce that and bottle it in a short period of time. Like barrel aging is kind of the key ingredient to making that level of quality of rums. So we're partnered with a distiller in the Caribbean and we blend a range of ages of rums that we bring to Salem at barrel strength, so 140 proof. And then we do our own sort of work with the, the spirit. We bottle them all at 80 proof. We have two flavored rums, a spiced and a coffee. Um, and uh, so all that happens in our, our facility in Salem, Mass. So now, technically, you could have distilled the rum if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, there was, a, there's a, there was a big reason why you decided not to, and that was because of the time, right? The time and also there's, well, you're constrained a bit if you're going to distill a spirit, which I, you know, I love tasting all these new spirits that people are creating. But you make a batch and you can do some aging or some tweaking, but basically that's what you're married with. Mm -hmm. By going the route that we went, we have five different aged rums in our sipping rum, the Grand Reserve, like as young as five years and as old as 23 years. Mm -hmm. So we can blend different batches and come up with a real palette and complexity and flavor profile in the rum that we would have never been able to achieve just with a single batch that we were able to produce. Um, and where we wanted to launch a, a range of rums that was like the right path um, for us that was sort of how we chose to go that route because there would have been a lot of uh, anticipation and anxiety if you had to wait five years for your rum to get properly distilled before you started yeah and you know it's <laughs> I say that jokingly yeah of course. no but you're absolutely right there's a lot of money sitting in inventory if you're if you can't sell it and you're just and you're just waiting but also, it takes time to really get the cuts as it comes off the still to get the right, the heads, like the real good portion of spirit mm -hmm. that you want to bottle. And if we were distilling, you know, those first batches, you're not experts day one. So you're putting product out at market that may not be your best right. or what you will eventually right. evolve to. And so here we go. We got Rumson's Rum. This is just the, the uh, what would you call this? The, the, uh, the, the mainstay? The... The house rum, uh, what do you call this? Like We consider that our cocktail rum. It's a blend of five-year-old rum, so it's mm -hmm. a beautiful, um, beautifully distilled and aged rum. When, age, when I'm talking about age, we're talking about once used um, American white oak uh, barrels that were used for bourbon. Mm -hmm. Then they're recharred before they receive the rum. 
and uh, in the rum is aged, it rests in that for about five years in that rum. So the sharp edges are taken off. It is sort of the sharpest in the mouth of the four expressions that we do. But that's our cocktail rum. So think classic daiquiris, mojitos, um, Mai Tais. You know, you're, you're going to really enjoy that in cocktails. Mm -hmm. Because it's aged in bourbon barrels and because the white oak and the char kind of imparts its personality, there's a, a little bit of that bourbon-ish flavor. So there are folks that like a sharper bourbon to sip that enjoy that as a sipping rum. Yep. But the one just to its uh, side there, the Grand Reserve, that's the one that we designed to drink neat like mm -hmm. in a snifter, maybe with a big ice cube. Mm -hmm. But that's the, uh, the so Grand this, Reserve. This yeah. is this is the, the Mac Daddy of the rums right yes, here, right? Yes, that is Mac, Mr. Mac Daddy. Mr. Mac Daddy. Yeah. Uh, I love the logo. Thank the logo you, yeah. is uh, truly recognizable. Um, now, uh, where did that idea come from? Because, you know, obviously we get the image of uh, the pirate. Yeah, yeah. But you're like, wait, that... That pirate's a dog, you know? <laughs> so how did, where did that come from, that idea? Pirate dog, you're absolutely right. So Eric's very creative, and he's an owner of Boxer Dogs. Yep. So years ago, maybe 10 years ago, he had his brother-in-law, a graphic designer, create the logo modeled after his dog, Goliath. And the dog and crossbones became the name of his boat, Pirate Dog. Mm -hmm. And he had hats and shirts and things made up to wear on the so boat. So this is long before Rumson's or anything. He had just made an image of his dog as Pirate Dog. Yeah. And if he this, started, started making hats and everything with it. Yeah, like yeah. having fun with the brand. Sure. I mean, it, people loved it. He had stickers and it was, you know, his boat was Pirate Dog and his buddy was his pirate companion, you know, Goliath. And, uh, you know, rum at that point was something that you enjoyed on the boat as a beverage, mm -hmm. not as a business um, that we were pursuing. But he knew he was onto something with the logo. So his wheels were turning even way back then. What business am I going to one day launch that develops this as a brand, a national brand? Um, and eventually, as you know, lots of time fishing and smoking cigars and being on the boat and discussions and the story that I said before about him collecting rums, it led to, uh, to it becoming our brand for the, uh, for the rum. Well, it's a fantastic logo. It's, uh, it's, it's one of my favorites. And I truly feel that as time goes on, like I, I always like play a little game because uh, I know you. Yeah. Whenever I go into a package store, I walk right over to the rum aisle and I see if I can find it because if it's there, I see it right away. In a second, I yeah. see it. Uh, if it's not there, I always go up to the owner of the store and go, hey, I'm trying to get some Rumson's rum. Uh, where do I get it? <laughs> oh, what? Rumson's rum. It's my favorite. It's really good. And uh, uh, a lot of times they'll say, well, we'll look into it. You know? right, so, right. so you're welcome. Yes, uh, that, no, thank you. Yes. <laughs> You know, we don't have a deployed marketing budget, so that's the grassroots. If we could get, you know, a hundred of you out there saying, where's the rumps and rum? Like, that would be great. So thank you. We You're welcome. That. So now uh, we'll go back to the rumps and Well, by the way, if you, if you want to try some rumps and rum, you can pick it up at local package stores and uh, restaurants in the area. If you have questions of it and you want to know more about it, uh, go to uh, Steve's website, rumpsons.com. Um, and you can uh, find out more about Steve, more about Rumson's, uh, more about where you can get it. So, Steve, now, uh, as I said, you know, you're an entrepreneur and this is your latest uh, venture. Uh, we were talking there in between and, I, you know, you were mentioning how you had a paper route at one time and you started out like me. We're the same age. So, you know, it was a big deal when you were 10, 12 years old to get your paper route and go out there and make some, uh, make some money, you know. Uh, I always tell the story that when I was in junior high, uh, currency was bubblicious bubblegum, yeah. all right? Yeah. And the man with the bubblicious was the man who got all the ladies, yeah. all right? <laughs> and I learned a valuable lesson that when the money ran out and the bubblicious ran out, so did the ladies. <laughs> and I took that to heart, and I really learned that lesson. Granted, I was 35 before I really learned it, but <laughs> yeah. I, I, I got the premise when I was in junior high yeah. school. So you had some businesses, too. What was like your first uh, venture into uh, the business world? Yeah, it's funny listening to your intro and talking about your paper route, like my wheels were spinning and something that I had not even thought about it, that Eric was my first business partner. And so I'll, I'll lead into that. Um, but it's, it's funny to, to have that recollection. But I started, my dad was an entrepreneur. He started over 35 businesses leading up to building the world's largest clean room where you fabricate silicone wafers when the computer industry was building to like owning a dry cleaner. So he had a, a range of stuff and I sort of grew up, you know, going to business meetings with him. So I was exposed to it. So his first venture that he helped me launch was 
we would go into the swamp in Marblehead and we would cut bayberry and bittersweet, which grew wildly, these sort of like vines. And I'd go home and sort of make them into like wreaths or whatever and tow them around in my little red wagon door to door. Like, ding dong, want to buy some base, bayberry or bittersweet, <laughs> like, you know, to decorate your house at Halloween time. Um, and that led to uh, cultivate, not cultivating, because it also grew wild, yeah. um, horseradish root. So we'd go in, dig out horseradish, uh, grind it up and, you know, mix it with the vinegar and create little baby food jars of horseradish. Yeah. Of course, I had no FDA approval or anything, but, <laughs> but I'd go, ding dong, want to buy some homemade horseradish? So that was sort of like, before my paper route, I was like a door-to-door, -door random handmade item sales guy. <laughs> Throughout, you lived in Marblehead. In Marblehead, right? yeah. Like uh, all the neighbors, oh no, here comes the here neighborhood comes kid Steve again, Cricket. what's he selling this time? <laughs> just, just everyone don't move, he'll go away. <laughs> <Right. All right. laughs> Keep the curtains down. <laughs> now how old would you say you were at that, at that, time, that point? I was probably like nine or 10. Nine or 10 years yeah. old. Um, and I imagine that it was probably pretty exciting, wasn't it? it yeah. Yeah, it was, I mean, the money, exactly. Like when, when you get the money and you can go out and buy whatever it was back then, it was like hockey cards or baseball cards yep. or, or uh, you know, the trip to the candy store. You're right. That was current. Candy was currency. Candy back. was big currency back then yeah. as a kid, you know, and the kid who had the candy was pretty popular and, you know, he, right up there on the, uh, on the food chain of kids, you know. Yeah. Uh, but that's, that's I, I always think back, like I get that feeling again of excitement. Like, you didn't care if someone didn't want to buy your horseradish. Yeah, right. Yeah, you didn't care if someone didn't want to buy your little wreath. You just went to the next house, next right? Next house, yeah. And, and when you made that sale, that was what you were excited about. Yeah. Now, as a kid, I don't know if you really consider it. I, I know you do. You consider it a sale and you consider it an opportunity. But there's something, there's a measure of pride that comes with that. Right. Like satisfaction. Yeah. And I think that's what the entrepreneur gets is the satisfaction of the starting at no I at nothing and going to culmination of this yeah. all right yeah. and it's in the store and someone picks it up and it's drinking it and then you see a really good review on your website that says right. oh the spice rum the grand reserve is great i gave it away at christmas yeah. you know uh so that's great so horseradish, horseradish. Um, <laughs> that's i didn't even know that you could do there was horseradish where do you get a horseradish it's a swampy like root and it's got a big leafy, you'd never know it was horseradish unless yeah. you knew it was horseradish to dig it up. And my dad knows sort of a little bit of everything. Yeah. And so he knew where to look and what it looked like. And his dad might, must have done it with him or something. My <laughs> grandfather, when he was a kid, I don't know. That's so funny. Yeah. You're, you're right. So no FDA approval. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, you'd probably have someone knocking at your door saying. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, we we went from t into the highest regulated, you know, besides, you know, drugs. But like the government <laughs> wants to know what's in those bottles and how much tax are we going to get on each sale. And now, that. would you say that get going through the regulation of becoming a bottler, a distillery, was that the hardest part? Would you say most complicated part? What um, we yeah, because we didn't have a big budget to employ lawyers to do it for. So Eric did most of this groundwork himself. Um, some of the applications are straightforward. We have federal licensing as a distilled spirits plant. Then we have some state licensing that was a little bit confusing and it was hard to get feedback as to which exact license that we needed. Mm -hmm. and then strange things happen that you, you can't account for in any business or life. Like if you remember the government shut down the sequester that yep. happened as our applications were being reviewed. So it added an extra 10 months because of the backlog that developed. So um, it wasn't necessarily the hardest process, but it was a frustrating and sort of a, you know, a learning curve trying to yeah. understand it all. Yeah. So like uh, nobody, you, nobody's going to put that in their business plan. Uh, right. Government shut down 10 months. Let's account for that, Eric. Right. Okay. No, you know, it just happens. And you have to, have, you didn't know it was going to be 10 months. You probably thought it maybe, maybe a couple of weeks. And yeah. then after a couple of weeks, you're like, well, oh, maybe end of the month. Yeah. And then by six months, you must've just been like, what? How long can this go on? Right. You know, or yeah. at that point, I guess you were backlogged more, right? Because the government wasn't shut down for no, no, no. Yet. Yeah, it yeah. was that that department. I think had had a lot of processing to do to well, catch up. I admire your staying power. <laughs> so okay, so after horseradish uh, and wreaths, um, what 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 did you do? Now you're getting into middle school, high school. Uh, what did you do next? Well, I hadn't thought about this until, you know, like I mentioned, listen to your intro, but Eric and I, he was my first business partner, and I think it was his grandmother um, might have had some Japanese roots, and she knew the art of origami, 
and could make really incredible things. So some really kind of technical paper airplanes were designed that she helped him create and he helped me like to learn how to do it. So we sold paper airplanes to kids at recess Yeah, at school. We had like this paper airplane business and it became a fad, you know, like how kids like everybody wants to do this. So all the kids, you know, were flying these airplanes. So we'd make them for like a dime or it was like the supermodel that was a quarter or whatever, whatever it was. <laughs> it didn't last very long. Yeah. We eventually we moved on to kickball or whatever we were doing <laughs> at, at recess. But uh, it, I hadn't thought of that in years, but we had this paper airplane business. Your little paper airplane business. Yeah. What I like about your paper airplane business is that you, uh, you, you, re you probably sourced your material right from Marblehead Public Schools. Yeah, exactly, right. <laughs> and then took it and, you, uh, and you, you were able to capitalize on it and make some money and your product was free other than your time. Yeah, very much like the bittersweet and horseradish. Like, just go dig it up. <laughs> See, that, but that, you know, we're joking, yeah. but that's, uh, that's like some grassroots uh, business right there where sure. you, you can do things where it is a lot of sweat. It's mostly sweat, you know, yep. you got to put the time in uh, where, uh, you know, it, it takes time. I, I, there's this great audio clip of Ira Glass. He does uh, This American Life, okay. and he talks about how when you first start something, uh, the reason you start something to be like uh, an entrepreneur or create stuff or do uh, you know radio show or TV show is you have good taste, all right? You have good taste. You have good taste here too, you know. You have good taste with the airplanes and your horse rush. All that you have good <laughs> taste, you know. But your first product's not that good. Not yeah. that good. And it's disappointing because as a person, a creative person, you got good taste, you know. Right. So he says it takes a couple of years of working at it, and the only way to get through it is to do it and do a lot of it. And eventually, you get to the point where you want to be. But he says most people, when they start doing their, their product, whatever it is, mm -hmm. it's, it's so disappoints them because it's not that good that mm -hmm. they quit. So you can't quit. You've got to right. keep going, you know? Right. Um, by the way, if you want to check anything out, I have a Facebook page called The Matt Lagore Show at Facebook. And I have a lot of nice little clips on there. I have some uh, clips from my radio show. Um, I also have, uh, I'll put uh, Steve's website up there. So, Steve, let's just go back to being an entrepreneur. So now, uh, you know, obviously you didn't make a living at uh, selling paper airplanes. No, we, uh, you know, we moved you, on you, from that. You yeah. moved on from that. And you said your dad was an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. What kind of businesses have you been in throughout your life? Um, I ended up, uh, I studied entrepreneurship in college, Babson College. I think it was maybe the first in the country to have a major. Like entrepreneurship was sort of a trait that people had or didn't have, and it wasn't a an area of study and my professor Dr. Timmons was sort of one of the leaders and thought that you you would teach it and that it could be like a skill set that you could learn. I think the drive and the passion and the risk taking is inherent. Maybe you do or don't have that. Um, but coming out of Babson, I, uh, I, it, it was the, a big recession. I wanted to be a real estate developer mm -hmm. and that was sort of what I was aiming for. Lots of interviews, nothing was really happening at this time. So I started to help a small local business that had, uh, it was a family business. They had at that point, I think three like retail clothing stores. And um, I just had a lot that I could offer. And I ended up becoming a big part of the company and we grew it to, I think we had 10 stores and a manufacturing arm. So I found myself sort of accidentally in the retail in women's fashion. Like I had, you know, that was not my <laughs> aim, but accidentally here I am. So I left there. My wife and I started together a chain of women's clothing boutiques. Um, what, what was the name of it? Glee. Okay, yeah. Prior to the television show, yeah, which, yeah. you know, they licensed our name because they thought we had such a great name, <laughs> which is not true. <laughs> but it did help our Facebook page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we were Glee. We had five stores. And, you know, in the department of things you don't come seeing, see coming down the road in a business plan, um, when Lehman Brothers went under in 2008 and the credit default swap um, hit, people didn't need $150 jeans anymore. Yeah. So our, our business plan was to build a, a, a regional chain and then sell it. And um, we sort of like were derailed from that plan when the economy changed. So we sold that business and, yeah. and moved on. Sometimes you just have to know, like part of entrepreneurship is knowing when to move on. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of like try, try, try till you succeed mentality but sometimes you just you have to know when to like move on to the next thing you got to know when to cut your losses yep. right yep. you just got to know it hey it's time and move on to something else exactly um 
So, okay, so you, 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 you've experienced success, failure, you ended up in places you didn't expect to end up in, in women's clothing. Yeah. Uh, you know, funny, you know, but it's, it's, it's just where it ended up. Um, but you're not only just like an entrepreneur for yourself. Do you, you help people, though, too, don't you? Am I right about that? Yeah. yeah, you know, you get a lot of folks that know what you're doing or what you've done that are trying to do something similar. So I've, I've never really formalized a consultancy business. I did some retail consulting as I was selling my business. Um, trying to sell a business in one of the worst economic meltdowns uh, was a really interesting um, experience and I gained a lot of insight like how do how do you sell your business without your employees knowing you're selling it to avoid creating that panic and um, so I did I did some consulting on like how to how to sell your business mm -hmm. and how to develop a retail chain uh, but I enjoy talking to people I enjoy helping um, people so yeah it hasn't been formalized as here's my occupation but that's you know depending on where we go with Rumson's um, I, I I like the idea of maybe coming back to teach college or teach uh, teach kids, um, you know, the the area of business that yeah. would sort of focus on entrepreneurship and encourage people to start their own businesses. That's nice. That's yeah. nice. Now you're probably, you're you're a very easy guy to talk to, and I, I, I've called you up on several occasions and run things by you and asked yeah. you to check something out, and you've always been very gracious and giving me your time and everything. So after the uh, clothing store, um, uh, you know, you, you had to, you had to stop doing that. You, uh, you even tried your hand at some network marketing. I mean, mm -hmm. you're not afraid to try anything. Obviously a guy who's willing to sell horseradish door to door is not afraid of a no. Now what would, nobody likes to be told no. So let me ask you a question. How do you feel when you approach somebody kind of cold call them how do you feel? What's your what's going on inside you? Um, well, there's always the anticipation, and you're looking for success, and like, how's this going to go? Um, I tend to my personality is I just sort of roll with things. I always try to see things from somebody else's perspective, um, and I you know try to anticipate like like what their motives might be. Like often, no is not no. It's just not right now, mm -hmm. or like this idea is new to me or I'm familiar and I'm uncomfortable with it now, but so I'm going to say no because that's safe for me to say. But it, but you kind of have to read, like, is this really a no or shall we revisit this in, in the future? So, you know, as you're approaching any sort of, and everything in life is sales, you're, you know, you're selling to your girlfriend, like, let's get married, or you're mm -hmm. selling, you know, trying to get, get a date or everything is sort of sales in, in life. And, um, trying that feeling of uh, making a pitch like it's only Eric and I like we have a pretty big company right now but it's just the two of us so I'm knocking on doors every day saying these are our rums uh, they're excellent will you try them can you sell them in your store will you put them in your bar um, so that's like a daily experience for me and and if it's no I kind of like in my mind is I know you're saying no but I'm still very optimistic that in two months, when you see all the awards that we're winning, yeah. you'll be like, hey, can you come back and show me that rum again? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you can't take no as a defeat or it's an opportunity to learn and, and hone your skill in the presentation or, or whatever. No means a lot of things. Yeah, you know? and, and you, certainly you can't get mad. Like you can't get mad. No. You can't be like, ah, forget this guy. Yeah, no, He's no. never going to get my run, you know? Yeah, and life's too short to get mad anyway. Like, <laughs> forget about it. Move on. <laughs> so uh, so I, I think that the, the Rumson story is really great because you and Eric came up with an idea. Uh, you talked about it as friends. You started doing investigation because that's the next step. You yep. start doing investigation. And, uh, you know, I always like the illustration that, you know, when you and Eric were sitting there on the boat, let's say, on Pirate Dog, you know, and you talked about it, um, you didn't map it out right to the end. You just said, what's the next step, right? Right? Was that what you'd say? You just, you always went to the next step. Um, yeah, well, you know where you want to end up. Yeah. Like, you know what the, you want the brand Yeah, you to know you at. want to get there, right? But we were allured by, we were like, oh, it'll be really sexy to have copper stills and like, because we were both <laughs> brewers, you know, when the yeah. homebrew craze hit mm -hmm. back in the 80s or whatever, we were into that. Um, and the idea of crafting your own product like we were excited about that we had no idea we we're going to take a turn um and and go the direction that that we went in the moment so it's like you know where you want to end up but you're not sure exactly which which way you're going to get there so it's a lot of um evolving yeah yeah so that's a good point like you know where you want to go like um you know i always say say 
Uh, I know I want to go on vacation, and I want to go to Europe, okay? I want to go to Italy. I want to be in Rome, okay? Yeah. Um, but there's a process to that, you know? I have to call a travel agent or go online, buy the tickets, uh, prepare, uh, have someone watch my dogs, you know, yeah, all that stuff that goes into it that you don't think about, you know, right. oh, yeah, I got to have money when I'm there, you know, all that stuff, you have to go through the steps. And sometimes, you know, especially if you're going on vacation, you might look at that price tag and go, yeah, you know what, I'll just go to New Hampshire. Right, you know, it's right. fine, you know. So uh, the, the, the process, and I think the process is really the most exciting part of the journey, uh, getting from A to Z, you know, but all the letters in between, mm -hmm. I think is pretty exciting. So let's just go back to the rum here. Uh, and just talk about it. So you said this is the mixing rum. Yes. Okay. This is like the, the Mac Daddy, the sipping rum. Okay. What about those two? So now we, these are sort of our pure play rum products. And then we had some fun. We took some aged rum. They're still about two-year-old rum. So very nice, high-quality rum. And, you know, the biggest selling rum category out there is spiced rum. Mm -hmm. There are some big players in that area that when they say I'll have a... Um, you know, they, people call for this a lot. Spiced rum and Coke. I won't name any names. You yep. know who we're talking yep. about. Yep. They have an enormous market. There's a lot of spiced rum drinkers. So we wanted to do a different spin on that. Mm -hmm. So all the names are found in this badge here. They look pretty similar to the bottles. Yep. Um, but the spiced rum are natural spices. So we designed that um, also to be a mixer. But in all of our rums, we wanted, like our goal was to make spirits of a high enough quality that you could sip them straight. Um, so a lot of people do. I enjoy this over ice with just a squeeze of orange. Mm -hmm. um, but this is for, for, um, for mixing drinks as well. So pineapple, any kind of citrus, any kind mm -hmm. of soda is great with that. Um, when you taste this, it's a little butterscotch, vanilla, caramel up front, yep. hints of nutmeg and clove at the end. Um, so it's different than any spiced rum that I've had out there. Like it's our spin, it's unique. Yeah. Coffee rum, these are all really more about the rum. This is all about the coffee. Yeah. If you like coffee, this is the rum for you. We, we blend it, the same two-year-old rum, we blend with a Colombian Arabica roasted coffee bean, um, some hints of vanilla, but really bold coffee flavor that, that's at 80 proof, too, which is unusual for a spirit, um, you know, a coffee spirit. I think we're the only 80 proof spirit mm -hmm. out there. But it's wonderful in iced coffee or hot coffee or things that you do with... Um, Coffee liqueurs, white Russians, mudslides, that sort of thing. Sounds great. <laughs> making, you, making you thirsty? <laughs> it <yeah>. is, absolutely. <laughs> so, Steve, before we uh, wrap up here, um, thank you for being on the show, obviously. Uh, we we're, uh, recommend everyone try some Rumson's Rum. Uh, local liquor stores and restaurants, go to rumsons.com. But now, uh, this show is about being an entrepreneur and about maybe uh, moving, pushing someone over the brink, you know? A lot of negativity. A lot of people tell you, no, stay safe, right? Right. Uh, you know, you hear that. People be like, Steve, what are you doing? Why are you doing that, Steve? Are you nuts? You're going to lose all your money, right? Yeah. Don't do that, okay? Go be a salesman or something, right? There's a lot of things people probably said to you. Yeah. Um, what do you say to somebody who really wants to do it, but they're a little scared, a little nervous, and they don't have a lot of good support around them? What do I say? Well, without knowing what they're talking about, I'd say go for it. Right, <laughs> okay. Say, tell me what your idea is, and I'll tell you whether you should go. Pe you know, there are ideas not worth pursuing. Yeah. Not everybody sees that mm -hmm. for themselves. So sometimes uh, people's advice might be worth adhering to. Yeah. But for the most part, if, you know, if, but explore it. Don't not explore it. Yep. Find a way to do it without overcommitting financially. Mm -hmm. There's so many ways now that you can... Um, vet your idea and and get things to market uh, inexpensively like crowdsourcing of money through like Kickstarter and, and so forth you can you can gain some support and backers and finance to try like to sort of throw the spaghetti against the wall and see if it sticks mm -hmm. like if you start if you have an idea and you put it out on a Kickstarter and nobody gives you money then maybe the idea needs to be tweaked or yeah. or something like that right, but right. there are ways to begin to pursue your dream without becoming overly exposed and hurting yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the first, take the first step, and like you say, it'll lead to a next step. Um, if you know where you want to go, you'll figure out the steps, and if it's a good idea, you'll know it. Like it'll, 
you'll get the right feedback that says there's something here and, right. and pursue it. So all, right. Guess, all right, so boiling it down, yeah, boil take it down. the first step. Take the first take step. The first Go step. for the first step and yeah. see where it leads. Because like you're right, not every idea is a great idea. Yeah. All right, And sometimes when you speak it you know, yeah. and you say it to someone else, you hear it, and you're like, Wow, that sounds that doesn't sound like a good idea when you say it like that. <laughs> but you know, if you don't expose, you know, if you don't share yourself, yeah. what do you have in life? You know, you're just you're just going to be sitting alone by yourself, wishing you did something, wishing you didn't. You know, better to swing the bat uh, and strike out than sit there and go, I wish I'd just taken one swing. You know, absolutely. So go for it, absolutely go for it. Uh, take the first step and uh, ask for advice. All right, see where it leads. So, Steve, thank you. Always a great guest. Uh, and, uh, you know, I want one more thing I want to say. Steve, you don't just, you're not, you're not Mr. Uh, 24-7, you know. You, you're not going to leave here and start bottling, and then after that <laughs> i got to go take some sales calls and get home, make the phone calls. You just came back from Nantucket. You were on vacation. So you enjoy your life too, right? Oh, you get to make time for family, family and friends. And um, fortunately, this business dovetails with a lot of fun things to do. So tonight I'll be at a yacht club doing a tasting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it'll be a, a fun environment. The people will be enthusiastic. They'll be having drinks. So for me, yeah. that's work, but mm -hmm. you know, it's fun. It's fun for me. In Nantucket, um, I did tastings down there. I left the island. We do a lot of sponsorship of sailing regattas. So I went to Provincetown for um, a race, the Behringer Bowl that we were sponsoring for yeah. the after party which was work, but it was all, you know, fun. Mm -hmm. um, so fortunately, I find myself in an industry where working long hours and, and doing all these events are also, you know, personally enjoyable. So you have a good time along with pursuing your dreams. Yeah, but and you do have to, to your point, you do have to kind of cut out. So I'm, surfing's my thing. So yeah. that Nantucket trip, like I'm in the water and, and we were blessed with waves, so, you know, three or four hours in the water surfing like does for me that's my um like my zen my mind clearing my meditation yeah or, or whatever so that's what that was all about totally recharge right? yeah you got to recharge yourself so you can get back at it all right so this is steve orn co-founder of rumson's rum here is product right here rumson's you can check them out at rumson's.com uh and uh, local liquor stores and restaurants so thank you for watching the matt lagore show we'll be back soon